everyone. Welcome to episode 173 of the Book Cougars, two middle-aged women on the hunt for a good read. I'm Emily. And I'm Chris. Welcome. We're so excited to be here. We've past New Year's. How often do you say Happy New Year? I don't know. I don't know. Happy New Year, everyone. I mean, right through the month of January, I think. Is, okay, you know. I'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a nice thing to say. I love the New it Year. It is. Yeah, 2023. Yes, and we have a bunch of thank yous. Yes, we were so excited. We have six new patrons to help us kick the new year off. Thank you so much to Brooke Nancy, Joyce, Roxanne, Linda, and Terry. Yeah, and thank you so much also to Joan, who increased her monthly membership. Thank you so much. And then thank you to Trisha and Andrew, who supported us via a personal check donation, which you can also do. Any questions, email us at bookcougars at gmail.com. We did a lot of housekeeping on the last episode, but we forgot to mention our YouTube channel. Yeah, we have a YouTube channel where originally we had posted videos of us, sometimes snippets of author interviews. And then last year, we actually started putting just the audio version of each episode there as well, because we learned that some people like to listen to podcast episodes on YouTube. So check it out. It's Book Cougars. You can find us that way. And we do have a variety of different types of videos up there. And then as again, just the audio, but we mark it as audio only. And if you subscribe, I believe you can set it to give you a notification if we post something new. Yeah, because it's not other than the podcast, which is obviously dropped every other Tuesday. We have things that show up here and there. Right. We're not very scheduled or disciplined when it comes to YouTube. But we are with the podcast. Absolutely. So don't hate. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no, this podcast, every other Tuesday, going on our seventh year, as I said on Twitter, we don't believe in seasons here or vacations, apparently. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, we are the gift that keeps giving every other Tuesday. We break your TBR. (laughs) And we also want to thank people who have been participating in our listener top 10 form that we put out. We announced that in the newsletter with a link. We talked about it on the last episode. There'll be a link in the show notes. We are extending participation to January 22nd because it's so fun. It is so fun. And thank you. As Emily said, we've gotten a bunch of people submitting. And if you're having a challenge with the link to the Google form, feel free to just email us bookcougars at gmail.com. You can email us your list that way, just author and title, and we'll put it into the spreadsheet. Yeah. So we want everyone to be able to participate that wants to. It's been really fun to see things come in. I'm loving the comments, including someone that put her top 10 and then put a list of people that like John Steinbeck, Willa Cather and uh, Bram Stoker, I think was one person, but she said they're all dead authors. So I don't think they'd mind not being on the top 10. (laughs) Which is a a fun way to think through your top 10, you know, like (laughs) if you want to try to figure out how to make it 10, because we all know that's so hard. Yeah. And again, it doesn't have to be books published in 2022, just whatever you write in 2022 that you would put on a top 10 list. Yeah. So reminder that that link will be in the show notes. So Chris, what are you currently reading? I'm currently reading The Winter of Our Discontent by John Steinbeck. It was his last published novel and his only novel set on the East Coast. And I am loving it. I'm just over the halfway mark. It's really good. It's really different. It was kind of a challenge to get into. And the main character, he always refers to his wife as a different nickname. And he does a lot of, you know, goofy, silly talk. And that's one of the reasons I DNF Stephen King's, is it Lindsay's story? Or Lizzie's. Liz's story. Yeah, I don't even remember now. Because the couple cute talk got to be a little bit too much. I mean, there were other reasons too. But wow, I am loving this novel. The cutie nicknames and stuff have really grown on me. And I think it's definitely part of the character's character. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. I won't say more because I know we'll be talking about it at a later date. I do have one question. Are you only reading it or are you listening to the audio as I'm well? only reading it. Okay. And I'm reading like 40 pages every morning. Oh, nice. Yeah. That's a good way to do it. So I'm just doing it that way. Even though like yesterday I was tempted to keep reading. I was like, nope, just do your thing and move on with all the other things you have to do. So self-control so early in the year. I'm uh, you know, what can I say? It's a book club book. So I'm right. trying to be disciplined. Yes. Well, I'm currently reading Rough Sleeper 
Dr. Jim O'Connell's Urgent Mission to Bring Healing to Homeless People by Tracy Kidder. People might recognize Tracy Kidder's name. He's a Pulitzer Prize winner. He won for The Soul of a New Machine. I think that was back in the 80s. And it was about this engineering group racing to create a new computer, essentially. I fell in love with Tracy Kidder reading Mountains Beyond Mountains, which was about Paul Farmer, the founder of Partners in Health, Mm. who died recently. I gasped when I heard that. Yes, you talked about that, I remember. Yeah. Yeah. But this new book, Rough Sleepers, the term rough sleepers is a British term for people experiencing homelessness, which I'd never heard before. Me either. And um, Tracy Kidder followed Dr. O'Connell for five years before he wrote this book. And it's narrative nonfiction, and it's about Dr. O'Connell graduated from Harvard, was set to start this fellowship, like some fancy schmancy fellowship in oncology. And then someone in the medical community in the Boston area, they had been awarded a huge grant and asked him if he'd be willing to take just one year before starting this new fellowship to establish critical health care for the homeless community in the Boston area. He stepped in thinking he would do it for one year, and it's been his life's work. Wow. Yeah. So I'm about, mm, I don't know, 30% in. I'm reading it on my e-reader, and this book um, publishes on the day that this episode drops, so on January 17th. Really enjoying it. If you are a Tracy Kidder fan, if you love nonfiction, this is one that I would definitely put in your queue. Again, it's called Rough Sleepers by Tracy Kidder. So I'm still reading, I'm actually listening to How the Word is Passed, A Reckoning with the History of Slavery Across America by Clint Smith. So I'm listening to this through Libby. And a couple days ago, my checkout expired. It was gone. Oh. I was like, oh, and I didn't really even pay. I mean, I knew where I was. You know, he has different chapters where he's visiting different sites. So I knew where I was, but I thought, well, I'll have to just get the book out which I have a hard copy of the book and and figure it out. So when it was returned on Libby, I immediately requested it again. And I was like fifth in line. So I thought, oh, bummer, I'll get my hardcover copy out and just read it. But then today when on the drive over here, I opened Libby to find something else to read. And it said your hold is available now if you want to download the book. And I thought, great. So I downloaded it again. And then I was so surprised that it started where I had left off. Nice. Yeah, that was a complete shocker because I anticipated having to fast forward a lot to to find my place. So really amazing stories that Clint Smith is sharing here. I'm like 70% in, but he visits different sites and talks about the American culture that has sprung up around these sites and trying to interpret the history of these sites. So it's an amazing book so far. Highly recommend it. And then the other thing I'm reading, I am back in Outlander world. (laughs) (laughs) I downloaded um, on my e-reader Dragonfly and Amber, which is the second book from Diana Gabaldon, her Outlander series. And I'm about 20% into it already. I just love these characters. You had asked me before about the historical aspects of it. And a lot of it, it's just good fun. How historically accurate is it? I'm sure some of the things are and some of the things aren't, but I don't really care. Like I'm just enjoying the stories. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Some reading is just supposed to be fun. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Right. You know, sometimes I forget that because especially when you're in school mode or whatever. Yeah. It's fun to read. We read for lots of different reasons. That's right. right? Yeah. And sometimes it is just for escape and entering into a different world. And her books definitely seem like they check that off the list for sure. Yeah, they do. And it's really great how accurately they were adapted, you know, because I've watched the series as well on I think it's Netflix. Yeah. So that's really interesting as well. So what have you just read? I know you have a big stack there. I do. I finished the year out really strong and actually have started with a little bit of a reading slump, but it's not going to sound like that because since we did that episode with Russell, we didn't have an episode where we kind of talked about what we read towards the end of the year. So I'm just going to talk about a few of them kind of quickly. So one of them is A Late to the Party 
(laughs) book for me. It's called Una Out of Order by Margarita Montemore. This book was really popular when it came out in 2020. And I never got to it. It has a really recognizable cover because it's got this woman's face that's split into different sections. And each section, the hair color is different, which I didn't really understand until I read the book. I picked it up in a little free library. Oh, cool. And then it was just the right book at the right time towards the end of the year. The book opens in 1982. It's New Year's Eve, which is Una's birthday. And she's on the cusp of turning 19. She's at a great New Year's Eve party with all of her friends. Party ends, she goes to sleep. And instead of waking up in 1983 at the age of 19, she's 51 and it's 2015. So that's kind of the conceit of the book, that every year on her birthday, she celebrates a birthday and wakes up in a different year. But she still lived that number of years, which took me a little while to figure out. And each heading of the chapter will say her age and how many years she's lived. Okay. At first, I was like, oh, I don't know if my brain's going to be able to do this book. But if you just embrace it, it's really fun. And I will say, if you like music, music is definitely the thread that carries you through each of the years, which makes sense, right? I mean, music is very important in people's lives. And you can hear a song and it takes you right back to a certain age. Absolutely. Right? Yes. So I thought that was a really cute conceit of the book. And what happens with Una is... At some point in one of her lives, she made a ton of money on the stock market. And part of it is because she knows what's going to happen because she's lived in different time periods. I didn't think too deeply on that, but I was like, oh, that's a really cute way of making it so she doesn't really have to work, right? Because how would that work in the book? Yes, that could be really tricky. Yeah. So it's a super cute book. It would make a great book club book if you're looking for one and your book club hasn't read this yet. I highly recommend it. And so basically that Una out of order is referring to the idea of living your life out of order and really embracing being in the moment. And one thing that as I started to read it that I was wondering is if it was going to be one of those books where you try to change the future or mm-hmm. the outcome of things because you can do that. It didn't turn out to be that way, which I appreciated. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. So she remembers things then. So if she's 17, but she's really 56, she has all that knowledge. What happens is the Una that is going to disappear, essentially, not really, but you know what I mean? She knows she's not going to continue in that particular thread of her life when she wakes up the next morning, will leave her a letter. So she opens a letter to kind of get filled in on what happened, whatever that last previous year in her life was. And then she takes that knowledge and moves ahead in her life. And it doesn't happen consistently every year. There are hiccups in the story, which makes it fun. Yeah. But there are mysteries to her, of course, that she doesn't understand. Like, why has this person now that she was with when she was 51 and now she's back and she's 27? Who is that person and when am I going to meet them again? And there's love and sadness and loss and all sorts of things. So it was cute. Yeah. Oh, sounds I good. really enjoyed it. It was perfect at the time I read it. Again, that's called Una Out of Order by Margarita Montemore. Well, I started my year with an Alice Hoffman novel, one of them from her Practical Magic series, which is the third year in a row that I've done this, which I'm so happy that I started this. And I started this tradition because Alice Hoffman is one of Emily's favorite authors, and I hadn't read her prior to knowing Emily. And I thought, well, I'm going to try Practical Magic, because it is such a hit, and I love that. So this year, I read The Rules of Magic, and this one came out in 2017. I'm not reading them in any particular order. This one, I think I'm reading because you gave it to me. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. So this is the story of three siblings, Franny, Jet, and Vincent, and they're living in Manhattan in the 1950s, 60s, 70s. So it's really different from the other two I had read, which was Practical Magic and Magic Lessons, which was a 2020 release. And that was the one that goes way back in time to Maria Owens, who was the witch who came over from England to colonial America. So now this is the Owens family, a couple generations removed from what went down in Salem way back when. The Practical Magic series starts with Maria Owens, 
who is a woman in England who is considered a witch. You know, she does stuff with herbs and she may or may not have powers, but she follows the love and ends up in the colonies of America and she's betrayed by her lover. And so she puts a curse on the family. Anyone who falls in love with one of the Owens will not come to a good fate. Well, yes, yes. <laughs> it's cursed. Yeah, right? cursed. Okay. Yeah, that's a good yeah. word. Yeah. So each of these books follows usually two sisters, in this case, two sisters and a brother. And it's about their relationship and learning who they are, what powers they may or may not have, what skills they develop, and then also the love interests in their lives and what happens and how they deal with knowing about the curse, how they make choices that are maybe not for the best, right? I'll just lay yeah. it that, yes. at that. Yes, a little teaser. Because the, the <laughs> unfolding is, is the fun part. Yes, of course. Yeah, wonderful series. Loved it. I just love the way she writes characters. There's something like mythological about them or fairy tale-esque so that they're painted with kind of a broad brush. But then I get a sense of specific people as well. I don't know how she does it. It's really amazing. Highly recommend this series. I don't know what I'm going to do after next year because there's only four books in the series. So next year will be my last. That's going to be the Book of Magic, which just came out in 2021. Well, she does also have a 20 book backlist or something. So I know. you can always step into something else. Yeah, for yeah. sure. So, and she has a book coming out this summer yes. that we're both really excited about. So that was The Rules of Magic by Alice Hoffman. Highly, highly recommend this book. Sets so a good tone for the year. I'm so glad you enjoy reading her. I just feel like you're always in good hands with her writing. I mean, there's magical realism. There's a lot about nature and plants and animals and I just love her writing yeah I mean in real situations with people like in this book Vietnam the Vietnam War is going on the draft is initiated there are some heavy things obviously it's witchcraft and the witch trials and people being murdered so it's heavy stuff but presented in a way that I don't know it just makes me feel good that there's hope in the world mm, yeah well said. Yeah. And just the, the issues between siblings and relationships. It's a lot of sister stuff mm -hmm. in most of the books. Vincent is the first male sibling to be introduced, at least into the three books that I've read. And I was really pleasantly surprised in the directions that the story went. Yeah. 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 So loved it. Recommend it. What more can I say? Team Alice Hoffman all the way. <laughs> it was so cool. And we got to meet her back at one of the book expos. Yeah, we did. And I have a picture where my smile is very big. Yes. And Ellen and I, Aunt Ellen and I got to meet her at an event in New York one time. And I can't remember which book that, oh, I know which book that was, Faithful, mm. which is not part of this Practical Magic series. So, yeah, which is also a great book. Yeah, and that was like just around the time that we met, I yes. think, wasn't it? Before yes. we started the podcast. Yep, we yeah. weren't doing Biblio Adventures, or I'm sure your lovely face would be in those pictures with <laughs> us. <laughs> well, I read a book called Trespasses by Louise Kennedy. This is a debut, and this is a book that um, I'd had in my possession for a long time, started three times and just couldn't get into it, and again, just happened to be the right book at the right time over the holidays when things kind of got quiet. It is a little bit tricky in the sense that it takes place in Ireland and there are a lot of colloquialisms. It takes place during the time of the Troubles in Ireland. It's about a 24-year-old woman whose family owns a bar in Belfast and she's also a school teacher. They are Catholic. She gets into a relationship with a much older married man who's a Protestant and is a lawyer whose life's work is helping to defend Catholics who have gotten in trouble due to the troubles. Mm. So it's a complex relationship, as you might imagine. The horror and humor that can take place around terrible times, I feel like this author handled that with such ease. I couldn't believe it. I really recommend it. It was a great story. Very cool. And that's called Trespasses by Louise Kennedy. There's lots of reviews and chat out there if you want to read about it a little bit first before you decide if you want to step in, if you're one of those kind of readers. 
So I'm going to call this a just read, even though I didn't read every page, but I did look at every picture. <laughs> <laughs> it is a big, wonderful cookbook called The Walk, Recipes and Techniques by J. Kenji Lopez Alt. And he's also the author of The Food Lab. So The Walk, I chucked this out of the library. It caught my eye because when I make a stir fry, it's hit or miss. Like sometimes it's so delicious and other times it's like, ooh, it's mush. I thought I'm going to work on my skills. I used to have a wok, but I don't anymore. So the stir fries I've been making have been in various pots or pans that we have, you know. And this book, it's not just recipes, like it's the science behind wok usage <laughs> and what woks are and what woks are made out of and how to best utilize them. I learned so much, like the fact that Western frying pans are designed to have a consistent temperature so they don't react quickly to flashes of heat or they don't cool down quickly. It's this even temperature. So that's part of my problem, right? I learned also, too, about the wok has that shape, the bowl shape, and it has the flat bottom so that you can scooch your ingredients up on the sides when you add something new so that was really fun to learn about i can't wait to get a new walk or another walk i should say and really practice my walk skills he has history about the walk in here and then different types of walks and he does make recommendations and then the the recipes Oh, my gosh. He's like, you know, you don't really need a recipe. Once you learn the science behind wok usage, you just can go do whatever you do. But he does talk about how there are different steps depending on what you're going to be using and different aromatics and, and all that wonderful stuff. This is the first time. I mean, I sat on the couch and I looked through every page and I was like, wow, yeah, I can really see now how Emily sits in bed and reads a cookbook. And yeah. just looks at the pictures and thinks about the food. I used to think like, oh, my God, I would just end up ravenous. Yes. <laughs> you I, do that, too. Yeah, this, this does happen. <laughs> but, like, it was so pleasurable to just spend this quality time with this cookbook. Yeah, and I love a book that gives you some techniques. Like, even if you walk away with one new technique, it's great. And I actually recently read something that said that publishers consider a cookbook a success if people cook two recipes from it. Wow. So mostly what people do with cookbooks is just page through them and get ideas and techniques or maybe some new insight to something. So, yeah, wok cooking is so interesting because also classically they do it over flame, right? If you have a gas stove or something and you'll watch them bring their woks in and off the heat, which when we're cooking over electric, you can do it, but it doesn't have the same result. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Right. Yeah, especially if you're using a Western pan. Like, right. Good luck exactly. with that. I mean, he does talk about electric stovetops mm -hmm. and that, you know, it's doable, but you are going to have different challenges. Yeah. So. Well, I heard this is a total aside, but I spend a lot of time listening to chefs to talk about cooking. And this woman's name is escaping me, but she's a very famous chef that is all about wok cooking. And she told this story because you talk about, you know, like that typically they're not nonstick. Typically, you want to season your wok, and it can take years to get a good season. And this is a woman who cooks professionally and has probably 10 woks, but of course has her favorite that's been perfectly seasoned. She went to some show where they asked her to come on and cook. And then while she was being interviewed, the dish person who was cleaning up thought her wok looked so dirty so he scrubbed it and scrubbed it and with a huge smile brought her this bright, shiny, down to the steel walk and was oh like, gosh. your walk was so dirty, I cleaned it up for you. Oh <laughs> she said she just gasped, you know. Uh, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Yeah, he yeah. talks about seasoning your walk and, and how he treats his in terms of washing it and taking care of it. And he's like, the best way to season your walk is to use it. Yep. <laughs> A hundred percent. And then clean it appropriately for a walk. Yeah. You know? Great. I'm going to be borrowing this from Chris. Absolutely. Yeah. Because <laughs> um, I think it's going to be one I eventually buy. Yeah. Because I I, I want to have good walk skills. You know, I want to have some standard recipes that I know how to do and, and do a couple a week, you mm -hmm. know. Yeah. And it's a great way to use leftovers in the fridge, you know, or vegetables that are just about to turn. 
you can hide a lot in a stir fry. Right. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, and that's usually the best ones that I make. Yep. It's just all the stuff that we need to eat or it's going to go bad and we hate throwing out food. So yep. it's like, well, I'll make some rice and we'll just do this. You know, he does talk about like the nonstick, you mm-hmm. know, you don't want it to be nonstick yeah. because obviously, well, we know there's health problems with that eventually, potentially. But that, yeah, it slides down the sides and he's like, it kind of defeats the purpose of a walk. Yep. Very cool. So this is a library copy, but I think I'm going to offer to return it to the library for Chris and keep it for a week or so. And you'll get a workout. I mean, this is, it's over 600 pages (laughs) and of course it's, you know, cookbook. So it has these glossy pages. So yeah, you also get a good bicep workout. Right on. Build your appetite. Oh yeah. So I finished a book that Russell talked about on our top tens. This was the book that I ended the year and ushered the new year in. So I was reading it on New Year's Eve. It's called The Change by Kirsten Miller. This book, what happens is that when a woman goes through menopause, which is what the change refers to, she gets a superpower. And um, it's perfectly irreverent. If I had to choose two words, that's how I would describe it. The women, they have different superpowers and they're all facing different aspects of misogyny in their life that they're kind of over at this point and their superpowers are helping them to come to terms in a good way with that. There's a cast of characters. It takes place in Mautauk, which is a fictional town on Long Island. So it's very beachy centric and There's also a very unpleasant part of the book, which is that young teenage girls are being murdered. So there's this one side of the book that's, you know, irreverent and funny and women that are like just given what to to men because they've been mistreated. And then the other side is like trigger warning. Like if you really don't like to read about bad things happening to young women, you probably would want to stay away from this book. Mm -hmm. Not that there's details about that, but it's just an arc that is running through, or I should say a thread that runs through the book. I thought it was a little heavy handed at times, like, oh my God, could one man do one more terrible, awful thing? And thankfully she does have, I mean, I'm not saying men don't do that stuff, look, we all live in this world and see it and have experienced it. But she does have a couple male characters that, you know, are also do represent that there are good men out there. (laughs) So I really enjoyed it. It was a fun romp. It was the perfect book to read over the new year because it was just a page turner and not hard work. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. So again, that's called The Change by Kirsten Miller. And if you want to hear Russell talk about it, he talked about that one on episode 172. Well, when Chris walked into Book Cougar's headquarters today, the first thing I said to her is, I finished a book this morning and I'm completely wrecked. If my face looks like I've been crying, I have. (laughs) So I finished a book called Hello Beautiful by Anne Napolitano. This book publishes on March 14th. In the interim, if you've not read Anne Napolitano, I highly recommend you do. She has four books out. I've only read two of the the other books, and one was called A Good Hard Look, which is a fictionalized account of the last two years of Flannery O'Connor's life mm-hmm. when she moves from New York back to Midgeville, Georgia. I really enjoyed that book. And then the one that she most recently wrote before this one was Dear Edward, which was the book I talked about, about a young boy who's the sole survivor of a plane crash. Right, I remember that one. Another, I don't remember that one wrecking me, but it's definitely a thought-provoking book. And that one's just coming out in February as an Apple TV series. Mm -hmm. For those of you who were Friday Night Lights lovers, the people behind that series are bringing this one out, and it stars Connie Britton, who was in Friday Night Lights, who I love. So... I know what I'm doing on February 3rd. But anyway, (laughs) Hello Beautiful is her new novel. And oh, did I cry my way through this one. I mean, bring a box of tissues. And there's a fun little nod to Little Women in this too. So if you like Little Women, you might enjoy that. And it's about William Waters, who's a young man who grew up in a household on the East Coast to a mother and a father who were very cold and unloving. And it was partly because his house was haunted, not in a literal way, but in a figurative way, by the death of his sister, who died before he was born at the age of three. 
And he grows and grows and grows and becomes a basketball player in high school. And that kind of saves him, you know, just like going out and bouncing a ball and being part of a team ends up going to college in Chicago. So this book mostly takes place in Chicago, Chris. So I thought of you and goes to college to play basketball and meets a young woman named Julia Padovano, who's from a big Catholic family in Chicago. So he goes from being in this family where he was completely alone to being swept up in this huge, loving family of sisters and their father and mother who are adoring of them as well. As a matter of fact, the title, Hello Beautiful, is the greeting that the father gives to any daughter who walks through the door. Mm. So it's really sweet. And it takes place in a true neighborhood in Chicago called Pilsner. Pilsner, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's even a character in the book of a library, Landon Library or Lambden Library, which is a real library, like in the center of that neighborhood. Oh, cool. In her acknowledgments, Anne Napolitano said she took a little artistic license because the library opened in like 89, but she has it in 83 or something okay. like that, you know? So it's very Chicago. It's very family oriented sisters. And it just goes back and forth in point of views. But she does something I've never seen in a novel, which is She'll have the character name, and then she'll have a string of dates. So like this is William, November 1983 through January of 1984. And then the next chapter might be Sylvie, November 83 through January 84. So in other words, it's a character telling the story from their point of view after one character has. Interesting. Yeah. It was really interesting. And sometimes it's years, you know, like over the course of three years or something. I always wonder about what an author's process is when they're writing something like that. Do they have like an index card with those dates in mind? Or is that something that they add later? I don't know. I had I felt like she must have had like this huge whiteboard or strip of paper in her wherever she writes and just had a timeline, I figured or something. I agree. I was wondering that as I read it interesting. Mm -hmm. And also just turning it right just that little bit. This is how William saw it. And then this is how Sylvie experienced it. And then this is how Julia experienced it. And this is how readers gain empathy, right? Right. Exactly. You understand that people have such different experiences of the same situation or the same time period or living situation. A hundred percent. Yeah. Long book, it's 400 pages. So it took me some time to read. I felt like there were some things that she did really well, one of which was there's a lot about male friendship, which you don't often see in novels, female friendship, these sisters, forgiveness, guilt, grief. She covered it all here. Familial estrangement, chosen family versus family of origin, and then also mental health and depression. I thought she dealt with it in a very tender way in this book because it's a huge thread. So I cannot say enough about it. Pre-order it now. Tearjerker, if you like a good family drama, this one's for you. If you live in Chicago, I think you'll really enjoy it as well. Very cool. Yeah, I thought of you a lot. Again, it's called Hello Beautiful and Napolitano, March 14th. I read one other book, a short book, which I know you have just recently received in the mail. I had a lovely surprise this weekend, which is the gentleman caller and my daughter conspired to get my daughter here to surprise me for my birthday, which was really lovely. And then he gave us um, a trip to a local spa where we had lots of time together and some time apart. And in our time apart, we both read Shuli Kaywood's new book chat book called what the fortune teller would have said nice it was the perfect book you know if you had an hour or two it's flash nonfiction essays so highly recommend that we'll put a link in the show notes as we do with all of our books yes so you can find how to buy it yeah it was, so all of the books we mention are in the show notes and also you know sometimes publishers that we mention or just random things there's a category at the end called also mentioned where Emily will add those. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. And yeah, and, and so Emily's daughter lives in Michigan. So getting her here was no small thing. 
Yeah, it's always fun to get a surprise, but then also you have that thing of like, wow, people can lie to you and trick you really well and you fall for it. <laughs> you know. So Jim said we were going to the airport to pick up a friend of his and I was like, okay, whatever. It was really late on Saturday night. For people who know me, you know, I'm in bed at nine. So we were getting in the car, at, I think 930 at night. And I was like, I'm, you know, I'll be a good sport. I don't, I don't really want to drive around late at night. Anyway, out she runs, and <laughs> I was fully awake at that point. That's so, awesome. Yeah, it and it was lovely. so cool to meet her. It was yeah. my first time meeting her. Yeah, meeting her. really nice. Chris, did you go on any Biblio adventures? You know, I did. I've hit some used bookstores recently. I went up to the Book Barn in Niantic. I love saying Niantic. It's a town along the Connecticut shoreline, and the book barn is started as a barn with books, and they have all these different outbuildings now with different categories, different genres, and then they have different locations in town as well. And I have a couple different books and authors I'm looking for, so I went with my list. That was a lot of fun. And then I also took a walk on the boardwalk that they have. It's actually a concrete walk, <laughs> but, you know, boardwalk along the water. And there's a little free library right out there that I visited. So it was a lovely day. That's a nice little free library. I think that's where I found that rolled doll book that I talked about a while okay. back. Yeah, it's also doing double duty right now as like a lost glove. <laughs> right. uh, lost and found because there was an adult glove in there and then a little kid's glove. But I thought that's kind of nice because... Hopefully people will look in there. Yeah. Yeah. So great day for that. And then I also, on a different day, I went up to a town called Deep River in Connecticut to Bennett's Books, which is a used bookstore, and uh, had my handy list with me. That's a really cool bookstore. They're very uh, friendly, very involved in the neighborhood. They had a, a couple years ago, when you'd come in, there was a basket there to donate food. And that has since expanded now that in the back, on the outside of the store, there's actually a refrigerator and then a bunch of shelves with food. And you can leave food there in what the refrigerator or there so no one goes hungry in town, nice. which is really nice yeah. that they have that. Really helpful all the time, but especially this time of year. Yeah, that's great. very helpful. So, And um, you posted some pictures on our social media of that bookstore, and it was really funny because one of them behind you, there's like these towering stacks of books. So Jim and I were sitting there like <laughs> trying to expand the picture and figure out what all those books were behind you. It was very yeah, tempting. Yeah, it's one of those stores. It's a pretty small shop, but it is crammed full of stuff. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's the shelves are pretty well organized, but there are lots of stacks everywhere. I mean, there was an employee there doing a lot of shelving and making space. Mm. Yeah. Well, I had a really fun Biblio adventure for my birthday, which is I had talked about on our holiday episode, Julia Tertian and her cookbook, and that she does cooking every Sunday. She has Zoom cooking classes that you can sign up for. They are paid. You can buy a group of them or just buy one offs and you can participate at the time or you can watch the Zoom later and you can cook or you can just watch. Okay. And this particular one was three one pot meals. So I chose to make two of them and she sends you this incredible grocery list, which might have been my favorite part. I don't mind going to the grocery store, but I don't like organizing all of that. And she literally had it like organized by dairy and meat and things like exactly the way you'd shop, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm just want to report back that it was really fun. I recommend it. And I also invited a couple people at a distance, like my daughter-in-law in Colorado and a friend in Ohio. So it was kind of like having a birthday party. Oh, that's so cool. But I didn't yeah. have to do, I mean, I cooked, but I didn't even have to cook, yeah. you know. And then we've had food all week, which was really fun. It's great. So, yeah. Do you, are you up for telling us what you made? Sure. One of them was a turkey chili. And then the other was a turkey sausage farro stew. And farro is a grain I really like, but I don't cook with that much. So it was super fun to have an excuse to have a recipe with it. She's really laid back, too. So like the stew required fresh kale 
But when she went to cook it, she was like, you know, don't stress. If you don't want to buy kale and deal with it, just buy it frozen. And she had this little package of frozen kale, you know. Yeah. And all of it, these were one pot meals. So literally it all went on one pot. And she was like, you know, I hate doing dishes. I just want to make a meal. And I can also report that both of them were those types of things that they taste better the next day. Yeah. And I love leftovers. I just love food like that. And then I subscribe to her newsletter. She has a Substack newsletter that you can either get for free or pay. And this week's newsletter then was about one pot meals where then she kind of riffed on those recipes she made and showed you how you can just break it down and just like just do a vegetable, a meat, a liquid and a grain. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't even have to be that exact recipe she sent you, but it's an outline. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. She's a very... Cut to the chase, basic, not fussy cook. And I really enjoyed watching her cook also. Because for we talked about this recently. Like some cookbooks will show you the picture, like the final result. Like this is what your beautiful chili is going to look like. Some cookbooks don't do that, but they'll show you a step. Mm-hmm. You know, like maybe this is kind of a, you know, like what size dice should I do? Or how do you, what does the browned meat really look like? And she was really good about that. Here's what the meat should look like now. Here's this dice of this. Here's a trick for peeling garlic, you know. Nice. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. And I'm always impressed when people can do that. Because to me, it's a little bit like patting your head and rubbing your stomach, right. you know, <laughs> like you're talking, <laughs> cutting with a knife and stirring a pot, but really fun. So again, I'll put a link in the show notes to how to find everything Julia Tertian. Very cool. Well, I had a a, bib, a couch biblio adventure. I didn't realize that there was a new adaptation of the, the interview with a vampire, Ooh. a prime series. I just, I stumbled upon it the other night. I was just looking for something, an episode of something to watch. And I saw that and I was like, holy smoke. So it's an actual series. I read that it was just picked up for the second season as well. I only watched the first episode of the first season and I really enjoyed it. And I texted Aunt Ellen and I said, hey, did you know about this? And of course, she's already watched it and loved it. (laughs) Um, So, yeah. And that and interview with a vampire that was Anne Rice. Right? Anne Rice, okay. yes. I think it was the big book that really launched her. I think she had books before that, and she had a pen name that she wrote under earlier than that. There was a movie adaptation made starring Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt in the nineties, I think it was, or maybe even the eighties. I'm yeah, not they sure. Were young, I they were yeah, yeah, and that was a huge hit. Mm-hmm. Interview with the vampire, the novel, I really enjoyed it. And I enjoyed that adaptation as well. The difference with this new series is one of the characters is an African-American man. And since it's a series, it goes into greater detail about his background. So it's New Orleans and his life. And I don't want to give spoilers because it's been a long time since I read the book. So I don't even remember how much it goes into detail with the characters in the book. Isn't it like sexy vampire? Yes. Okay. Yeah, Lestat is a very sexy vampire. You know, it is gory. There's some blood, obviously, because it's a vampire situation. But there's like one gory scene that was kind of pointless. But you could tell they wanted some cool special effects to happen. (laughs) But yeah. Yeah, sexy vampire. I'll probably eventually watch the rest of it. It always makes me want to reread a book. Mm-hmm. It, does that happen to you too? Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. Or I even get it out of the library. Like I'm so enthusiastic and then I'm like, Oh, Emily, you know, <laughs> really? Yeah. yeah. I yeah. totally can relate to that. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it's nice to just check books out of the library and hold them and yes. have them and yeah. just return them. Put them on your head and hope <laughs> something will absorb. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, we had a fun little joint jaunt. Last week, we had a big business meeting, like our first of the year business meeting at Book Cougars headquarters. Just a little teaser. We have some fun plans ahead this year. Yes, we sure do. We're super excited. Our theme this year for our read alongs is books about books. If you haven't listened to 172 yet, we announced there that our first read along is Parnassus on Wheels by Christopher Morley. Yes. So and it's one of the first mystery books about books. So we hope you'll join us for that. Yeah, the Zoom conversation is February 26th at 7pm Eastern Time. 
send us an email at bookcougars at gmail.com if you want to join us. This book was published in 1917, so sadly we will not be talking to the author. <laughs> but the theme of books about books is there's so many options. Yes, yeah, so, so many options. So we're hatching some big plans. Yeah. And we're super excited. And we're just going to tease it there. More to come in yeah, the future. more to come. So we had this great big meeting, and then we got really hungry. And so we jumped in the car and we drove to New Haven. Yeah, and we ate at a place called Haven Hot Chicken. Mm, yum. Delicious. I just have to have a moment and think about that meal. Mm. A moment of silence for our <laughs> taste buds. <laughs> it was really good. They don't have seating, so we ordered and then we got in the car and we just stuffed our pie holes, basically. We did. It was great. <laughs> Then we drove over to Worcester Square, which is this beautiful neighborhood built around a park, which is why it's called Square. And there's a huge little free library there. Yeah, we've been to this one before a bunch of times, but we just stopped to check in on it and to drive around the square because it's always, you know, it's such a historic neighborhood. So lots of beautiful old homes. And it's just nice to see what's in a little free library. Always. Yeah. Always temptation and, we, and good things. And we added a couple. Yes. Yeah. Because we've both started driving around with a bag of books. Yes. So that we can take a book, but also leave a book. Yeah. Hopefully leave more than take. But you know, <laughs> years young. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> So upcoming jaunts, we have one next week together, the Vintage Book Club. Yes, and that's why I'm reading The Winter of Our Discontent, and Emily will be starting soon. Yes. It's really a good book. I have to say, it's about this man in New England. He's, well, you know, Long Island, um, comes from a very old family that was very wealthy, and they're no longer that. And he's working as a clerk in a grocery store. Mm. So it's really good New England vibes with that. And we'll be meeting at the Wood Memorial Library next Thursday, January 19th at 1, 1 p.m. Eastern. Yes. And it's open if you live nearby and you want to join. Yep. And then we have a joint John actually before that on Saturday. Yeah, we're going to Boston to visit Brattle Books, which has been on my list to visit since before we moved to Connecticut. I mean, <laughs> wow. I mean, and honestly, why I first wanted to visit was because it has a huge pencil over the front. <laughs> a huge number two pencil is part of like the architecture of the, you know, it's like a huge sign. Anyway, but it's one of the oldest and biggest used bookstores in New England. And they also have rare books as well. So I can't wait. I have my little list of authors I'm looking for. And then to browse some of the more rare antiquarian stuff is always fun. So check our social media because you're going to see a picture of us with a pencil over our heads <laughs> very soon. Well, I have an exciting one the day before Vintage Book Club up in Northampton, Mass, in partnership with Edwards Church is hosting Tracy Kidder in conversation with Dr. O'Connell. Very cool. So I am really hoping to get there. It's at 7 p.m. So this is Northampton, Mass., if anyone's listening to this episode on Tuesday, if you're interested in joining me on Wednesday evening, it's as far as I can tell, it's just drop in. I haven't seen any place to register. If I discover that, you know, as it gets closer to the date and as I'm putting the show notes together, I will certainly put it in there. But I'm hoping to have Rough Sleepers finished by then. And um, it's kind of a dream to see Tracy Kidder in person. I've never seen him and I do admire his writing so much. Yeah, that's exciting. Yeah. Very cool. Well, what about upcoming reads? Uh, the only thing I have on my list right now is The Winter of Our Discontent. I have an e-copy, but I really want to check out what's available on audio and then probably get a paper copy as well. Nice. Yeah. I think you're going to enjoy it. Yeah. What about you? Well, I have a buddy read coming up. It's of The Warden which is a book by Anthony Trollope, which came out in 1855. And Anthony Trollope is one of those British writers who I haven't read yet and who was so prolific. And he wrote v different types of series, huge books, you know, Victorian tomes. But The Warden is one of his shorter books. And it's also, I've been told, a gateway book into Trollope's work. So I had posted about it and Robin from Sacramento said that she hadn't read Trollope either and was interested. So we're doing a buddy read along with Thomas 
of the podcast, The Readers, which has since been retired. So the two of us, or the three of us, are going to be doing this buddy read, and we'd love to have other listeners join us. If you are interested, please just shoot us an email, bookcougars at gmail.com. And the read-along discussion is going to be on Zoom in early March, probably like March 10th, 11th, or 12th. We haven't nailed on a date totally, but that's going to be when my spring break is, so I know I'll be able to do it. Perfect. Yeah. That's great. I'm excited because, you know, it's to, to know that there's a potential I could enjoy this author and that there are so many books that could keep me busy for a long time. It's just kind of appealing. Yeah. And also daunting. <laughs> right. Well, but I think it's also just when there's that author out there. I mean, like Alice Hoffman was for you, like an author that you've heard about, but you haven't jumped in. It's fun to jump in, but it can be a little scary. So it's fun to have accountability partners yeah, along for the ride. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, people love him. Yeah. Yeah. They really do. So it's kind of weird. I didn't learn about him as an English major. Hmm. And my program is even heavy on... British lit. So it's kind of weird that unless I just spaced his name out, because right. I was enthralled with, you know, George Eliot, I don't know. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Um, so in the out now category, just to remind you, these are books we've spoken about on the podcast, but were not yet published and are now published. The Deluge by Stephen Markley, Reef Road by Deborah Goodrich Royce, and our mystery man, John Valeri, just interviewed Deborah Goodrich Royce on Central Booking episode 124. So I'll put that in the show notes. And then Night Wherever We Go by Tracy Rose Payton, which was one of my top tens of uh, 2022. So all of those are available for your reading pleasure now. Awesome. All right. Well, in our next episode, we will be rehashing listener top tens. So reminder, submit yours if you haven't yet already. And we're also going to be talking about our 2023 reading intentions. Mm. Yeah, Something to think about. Totally. Maybe we'll even open up a thread on Goodreads for people. Well, that'd be fun. Yeah, yeah. let's do that. No promises, but well, actually promises. Promises. Yeah. I'm going to go home and do it right now. All right. Yeah. Reading intentions, I 2023. I don't have to go home. I could do it right here. You could. Book <laughs> Happy, Happy reading. reading! Today's episode is sponsored by Shuli Kaywood's story collection, A Small Thing to Want, has won the Independent Publisher Bronze Medal for Short Fiction. Dayton Daily News called it the most exceptional short story collection in quite some time. And BuzzFeed News said the stories are beautifully crafted and dig deep into the realities of family life. Signed copies on sale now at tinyurl.com slash a small thing to want. We talked to Shuli about this short story collection on episode 100, if you want to give that a listen. And all of these links are available in the show notes. Thanks for listening to The Book Cougars with Chris Wallach and Emily Fine. We'll be back again with another episode in two weeks. Until then, come chat with us on social media, Goodreads, or email us at bookcougars at gmail.com. If you'd like to help support our podcast, please tell others about us, leave a review wherever you listen, and consider becoming a patron. Even a dollar a month is a big help. Learn more about that on our website, bookcougars.com, where you'll find the show notes for this and all of our past episodes. Thanks, everybody. This episode was edited by Pat Keogh Sound Design.